Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, um, it's my pleasure this afternoon to w welcome Bill Schur from the University of Rochester. Um, he was a graduate student there and is now a postdoc there. Uh, worked with Michael Scott, who many of you know uh, quite well. Um, and he's going to talk to us about some of the work that uh, he's done on synchronization and concurrency mechanisms. So, Bill? Great. Thank you. So uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. Um, I, I'm more important, or I'm more interested in having you understand what I'm telling you than um, finishing it in a particular moment. So as many of you are probably already aware, um, the ever-present um, um, push to faster and faster clock speeds to make faster and faster um, unit processor machines um, that Intel was saying was the way we were going to do things um, kind of hit the wall. And um, in 2004, um, you know, President Paul Ottolini officially announced that, or Paul Ottolini gave up on the idea of um, creating a 10 gigahertz processor and um, completely shifted the focus of the company to multi-core, multi-processor systems. Um, and at the time, he explained that um, we are dedicating all of our future product development to multi-core designs. And he went on to say that this is a sea change in computing. So right now, we're at the convergence of a couple of trends. So like I said, we've hit the power wall. And what do I mean by that? So as we um, keep ramping up clock speed, um, putting more and more components inside of a CPU, um, increase the amount of speculation, the density, all of this is increasing the amount of heat dissipation um, that is being done by the CPU. Um, and so we've gone from, well, for example, 10 years ago with a 286, you didn't need a heat sink at all. You just had the bare chip sitting on top of your motherboard. Now we've got these elaborate um, vacuum controlled fans and super massive heat sinks and we've so this power wall that we've hit is essentially we've hit the wall in terms of what can be done with an air cooled system um, and so but at the same time um, there's been a lot of a continued emphasis on performance for applications and so we need new approaches to, um, we can't just keep improving the performance of single process processors, so we have to go to new approaches to get better performance in systems. And in particular, um, multiple threads per core and multiple cores per processor is you know, pretty much across the board what people are doing. For example, Sun is currently in the middle of betting its company on a product called Niagara, which has eight threads per core, four cores per chip, 32 total thread contexts. Um, and Sun isn't alone. IBM, Intel, AMD, they're all doing the same thing. Um, and at the same time, multitasking is becoming increasingly routine for users. Um, so we've seen that new hardware can't really continue to improve the single threaded performance. So, so we're going more and more towards multi-threaded software in order to really be able to exploit the opportunities of modern hardware. Um, but at the same time, we're, this is becoming an issue because the average programmer out on the street can't reason about concurrency terribly well. Now, at the same time, um, you know, it might, one argument might be, well, concurrency is nothing new. SMPs have been around since the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but a lot of this previous research has been predicated on the assumption that um, you've got dedicated access to the hardware. Um, a lot of the applications that you run on the big iron from those days 
were the high-end scientific computing or big business servers. That, and in particular, one really key difference is that those applications um, didn't have to deal with preemption. User-level applications, especially when you're running multiple of them at the same time, um, are going to get swapped out. You can't assume dedicated access to the hardware because even if you've even if I restrict the number of threads in my application to the number of threads in the hardware, if another application is running at the same time, then preemption is coming in nonetheless. So traditional mutual ex or traditional synchronization is done using locks. And you've all seen diagrams like this. You all know how locks work. But many of you are aware that there are several problems with locks. And you can break them down into a couple of categories. So there are conceptual problems with locks. So on the one hand, if you use a coarse-grained locking solution where you put a single lock around an entire data structure to protect it, well, that's really easy, right? You just acquire the lock before making a change, release it afterwards. Um, it's great. But unfortunately, it doesn't scale well. You get a strict serialization of operations. Everything has to go one at a time, one after another, bring in multiple CPUs, multiple threads, you're not gaining a thing. On the other hand, um, fine-grained synchronization, where you um, partition the, an object into subdomains, each of which is pr protected by um, some piece of a lock, well, you, can, you have the opportunity for greater concurrency there, but at the same time, you're really um, introducing a lot of additional complexity in terms of avoiding deadlock um, and just getting the locking protocols correct. Um, and these lead into some of the semantic issues. So you're all familiar with deadlock. Um, any cycle and the locking dependencies will bring the whole system to a grinding halt. Um, similarly, priority inversion. If a high priority thread is waiting for a lock that's currently held by a lower priority thread, then the high priority thread is essentially downgraded in priority to that of the lower priority thread until it finishes, releases the lock, and the high priority thread is able to resume. Um, and there are performance issues with locking. Um, convoying. If you've got a system with a large number of locks distributed over different portions of it, ideally you would ex hope that you've got some threads working over here, some over here, and each doing a kind of a different part of the application at a time so that they're all working at the same time. But if you're not careful, what can end up happening is that um, as soon as you get a little bit of congestion at one lock, then all of the threads pile up behind it. And then uh, thereafter, they'll just kind of go through the whole system in lockstep, imbalancing the, everything on each, at each point along the way. Um, other performance issues. Um, well, we've mentioned preemption. If I'm holding a lock and I'm preempted, then no one can acquire the lock until I'm rescheduled. Um, if I, my thread happens to fail altogether, then no one will be able to get the lock ever again. But, um, but you know, even more subtly, um, if I take a page fault while holding a lock, then um, again, that's the, that entire time for the disk access to retrieve data um, to satisfy my page fault, um, again, no one, there's no utilization of the lock that's going to be able to happen in that time. So there's been a lot of research lately on alternatives to locking. And you know, one of the, you know, I know several of you here are interested in transactional memory, which, um, you know, again, this is probably something you've all heard a million times before. So, but you know, transactional memory, it, the idea is you treat your memory as a database and update multiple locations in memory using an all-or-nothing approach um, as per the style of transactions in database systems. And so, great, this is an easy-to-use metaphor. It's well understood. The database community has been doing transactions since the 60s. Um, the drawback so far is that there is a lot of overhead in transactional memory systems that have been currently proposed. Uh, relative to a coarse-grained lock-based approach with one thread, a transactional memory approach 
typically has a slowdown on the order of a factor of 2 to 10 for single-threaded performance. They, you gain that back as you go to multiple threads, but at lower thread counts, you're um, really um, paying for the overheads. Now, on the other hand, transactional memory has been the subject of a lot of research in the last couple of years, and so um, it remains to be seen how far those overheads can be brought down. Um, now, another alternative to transactional memory may be found in something called non-blocking synchronization, and in particular, ad hoc non-blocking synchronization. Um, and this is synchronization in which the failure or delay of any one thread can't um, prevent progress from the system as a whole. Um, and there are specific algorithms that are non-blocking, and these things can actually be faster than locks, than lock-based implementations. In particular, um, stack algorithms and queue algorithms are known um, that often outperform lock-based equivalents. On the other hand, these things are really, really hard to write, and you know, we're still pretty much at the point where every new result, every new algorithm is a publishable result. Um, it's telling, perhaps, that in the last three or four years, there have been no less than four papers on data structures as fundamental as queues published in the literature. Um, and so these things are really hard to write, and so the average user, you know, no way there, are they going to be able to do it. But the flip side is that um, you have the ability to can non-blocking algorithms into libraries and just make them available um, for anyone that uses the standard APIs. And you know, libraries such as uh, Noble from the group at, Philippus Tsigas' group at Chalmers, um, or the Java Util concurrent library um, are good examples of this. So just to summarize all of that, um, if we plot how much effort it takes from the programmers versus how much um, scalability and system performance you can get out of it. So as we've seen, coarse-grained locking um, is really easy, but it doesn't get you much. At fine-grained locking, you can get um, you know, very good performance. I mean, things like Oracle um, use fine-grained locking to very good effect. But the amount of complexity that you incur in doing that is huge. Um, transactional memory, um, you know, software transactional memory systems currently appear to have somewhat le worse performance than hardware transactional memory systems. Um, now, I, sh I should add the caveat that all of these placements are approximate. Um, this, is, this is just sort of a general ballpark view. But the important point is transactional memory at least has the potential of getting really good scalability without requiring a lot of work. And that's why there's been so much interest in it. Um, ad hoc non-blocking synchronization, um, as I said, requires just tons of effort, but you can get really good performance out of it. Um, and if you can those into libraries and just make them publicly available, um, then you get kind of the best of all worlds. You have a standard API and you just use it and it's really easy to use and you don't even have to worry about how it's implemented behind the scenes. So my research has focused on the preemption problem and how to improve the availability of synchronization. Um, and so I've taken a three-pronged approach in my doctoral work. So on the one hand, I've worked on fixing locks to um, create scalable locks that are very strongly tolerant of preemption. So at PPOP 2001, we published a paper on queue-based locks with timeout, um, and then extended that to fully preemption tolerant queue-based locks in HiPC 2005, where we took the, a best paper award. On a parallel fork, uh, I've done a lot of work on transactional memory. So I've been involved in work on transactional memory systems, such as DSTM, which we published in Pod C 2003. Um, LCR 
and DISC 2005 were about, um, well, LCR was a comparison between DSTM and the OSTM system of Peer Fraser and Tim Harris. And DISC 2005 was our ASTM system that kind of takes the best of both worlds from DSTM and OSTM and gives a single system that gives better performance for either. Yes, Tom. So the A stands for adaptive. Um, I don't know what all yeah, th these are just DM, specific instances of. Okay, so ASTM is the adaptive software transactional memory system. Um, that was Marate, um, Scott, Scherer. So it came out of Rochester. Oh, it's Rochester. Okay. Um, OSTM is Harris and Fraser. Um, I assume you're familiar with that one already. Sure. So DSTM is the one is from Sun Labs, and it, the D stands for dynamic. Um, so the the ASTM is adaptive across several axes. Um, so um, within a transaction, you can do. Um, lazy acquire semantics or eager acquire semantics, depending on whether, so eager acquire semantics are where, for example, in DSTM, you acquire every object along the way, or whatever the level of granularity you want to use is. Um, acquire everything along the way, and um, then at, so you, that allows you to detect conflicts between transactions early, and, um, uh, no, you kind of do it as you go along. And then if you do hit conflict, well, I'll talk about that more in a little bit, but if you do hit conflict, then you uh, use something called a contention manager to decide which one to restart and which one to keep going. And lazy acquire semantics are you do all the work without making anything visible to anybody else, and then once you've got everything done, then you go through acquire everything and make all your changes. And so it's a much finer window for um, contention. Um, there are actually three other axes of, on which we were adaptive that are a little more difficult to describe quickly. So that's work on transactional memory system. And as I mentioned, um, contention management, where you, if there is conflict between multiple transactions in terms of requirement of need to access certain data for the transaction, then how do you dynamically decide which transaction to keep and which one to restart? Um, I've done a lot of work pioneering um, examination of this question, um, published papers in CSJP and PODC on um, candidate policies for this. Um, and finally, I've done a lot of work in non-blocking synchronization. Our work on dual stacks and dual queues that we published in DISC 2004 took the standard linearizability theory, which sort of the, way, the gold standard for correctness, and demonstrated how to apply and use this theory for objects with partial methods, which up until that point had not been candidates for um, the non-blocking approach. Then building on that work, our exchanger that we published in school 2005 and our synchronous queues that we just published in PPOP um, last month um, are actually practical implementations of dual data structures that um, both of which have been adopted and will appear in the next version of Java when it comes out later this year. So in this case, dual refers to the fact that, it, that a stack can hold either data or requests. So, either, so a dual queue can either hold an actual piece of data or it can hold a reservation saying, I want the next piece of data that comes along. I'll go into this in more detail in a few minutes. So in interest of time, I'm 
going to skip the work on locks and jump to um, transactional memory. And I'll actually spend most of the time talking about the work on non-blocking data structures. So transactional memories can be either hardware or software based. They can be lock based or non-blocking. Um, transactional memory was originally proposed as a hardware scheme that extended the functionality of caches by Herlihy and Moss back in 93. And transactional memory is a simple construction of concurrent objects. Again, you treat memory as a database and use all or nothing transactional approaches to update. So I'll be focusing on the dynamic software transactional memory system um, in this um, talk. And DSTM is a Java-based implementation of something called disjoint access parallel transactional memory. So disjoint access parallelism is simply the property that if I've got multiple threads or multiple transactions that are accessing um, completely disjoint data, then they can proceed in parallel. So DSTM had ob object level granularity and the idea here is you use a special interface to access objects. And once you've accessed the objects, you get a shadow copy that you can then modify um, behind the scenes um, with regular reads and writes. And the commit process is a way to affect all of your new versions of objects at atomically into the um, current versions. And if that commit operation fails, then you simply retry the transaction um, and hope that it works the next time. And if two tr transactions conflict, then we need to deal with how do we, how do we resolve that conflict. So you can have read-write and write-write conflicts. And in order to maintain atomicity and consistency within transactions, we don't allow transactions that have that conflict on data to, over, to proceed in parallel. Um, so we take all that decision of which one to kill or which one to delay and separate that out into a um, transactional, into a contention manager module that is completely orthogonal to the core transactional memory system. So these tr contention managers are very small modules that just capture the policy of how do we make these decisions. And they're, they're tiny, 15 to, I mean, a really complicated and huge one is 250 lines of code. Um, and they're just built using a very simple, straightforward interface. It's an, an event architecture. So there's an event for when a transaction begins, an event for when I'm about to um, access an object for the first time, an event for when I've successfully accessed an object, and so on. And then there's a um, decision question that the contention manager is asked. Um, there's a conflict between these two transactions. Do I kill the other guy or do I wait and hope that it'll finish and get out of my way? And in particular, this is a very knowledge-rich environment. So you can use things like time and the current hardware or software environment or even information on what you've been doing so far in the transaction itself to help you guide you in these decisions. Um, and the what, and, you know, this is really important because the, so the correctness of the transactional memory system as a whole is orthogonal to the correctness of the contention management system. So that means you can use whatever heuristics you want and whatever works well and you're, you're good. If you follow some very simple rules, then you're fine. So the question of designing contention management, um, you can liken it to steering between Scylla and Charybdis from Homer. So on the one hand, if I never abort a competitor transaction, then you can essentially land into something akin to deadlock where I'm blocked, I, I'm stuck on some other transaction waiting for it to get out of my way. It's blocked on me waiting for me to get out of its way and we've got a, essentially a deadlock. On the other hand, if we always abort the other guy, or if we overly aggressively abort the competitors, then you can have multiple transactions that keep 
clobbering each other in sort of a treadmill and you run into live lock. Nobody's ever getting anything done. Um, oh, and I should point out that the tiny text in the bottom corner is acknowledging that I stole these two images from Disney. So let me just give you a quick overview of some of the possibilities you can do for contention management. Um, so our polite manager just uses exponential backoff as per the Ethernet protocol. Um, I should point out this is the protocol that was in use when um, I joined the project at Sun. Um, and all of these other managers are my designs. So a timestamp approach says that whichever time transaction has been running the has been outstanding for the longest gets priority. Um, a kindergarten approach says in, in this approach we keep track of um, how we've made the decisions between pairs of transactions. And if I aborted in your favor last time, then if I run into you again, then I clobber you and I go. It's my turn. Now it's your turn. My turn. Your turn. Um, our karma manager um, goes into a bit more detail. So we prioritize transactions by how much work we've invested in them. If I've got a choice between clobbering a transaction that has acquired three objects and just really gotten started, or clobbering one that's been going for a while and worked on you know, a couple thousand objects. Well, from a system throughput perspective, there's no question which one should be kept going because we've put a ton of work into this one. And so we count the number of objects we've acquired as a measure of the priority of a transaction. Um, combining this with exponential backoff gives the Polka manager. And there are over a dozen more managers that I've examined in various levels of detail, incorporating ideas such as um, queuing, um, randomization, and so on. Oh, exponential backoff. The idea is if I find myself stuck behind you, then I wait for a certain amount of time to see if you'll get out of my way. If you're still there when I get back, I double the amount of time I'm willing to wait, um, and so on up to some fixed maximum after which, you know, if, if you're still there, then I clobber you and assume that you're dead and, in my, and you know, not making. Um, yes, in, but for example, with the exponential backoff, um, there's randomization in the um, backoff, so the chances of them conflicting ex at exactly the same point um, are probably fairly small. Um, and and any, in general, any sort of um, asynchronous events that happen in the system, such as an interrupt firing, um, all of these change the timings enough that you're, you're not going to stay locked into the same patterns. Um, however, I mean, you, you raise an interesting point. The, the DSTM system has a progress property called obstruction freedom. So progress is only guaranteed if a single transaction is running in isolation. Um, these are the contention management right question is how do we get as much performance as we can out of it in the case where we've got multiple transactions that are in conflict. So let me send, spend a little bit of time showing you um, some of the performance results. So these are collected on a 16 processor um, UltraSpark 3 Sunfire 6800 um, using the Java um, SE 5.0 hotspot virtual machine. And we just have a little reflection-based microbenching test driver that uh, runs transactions as quickly as it possibly can and captures the total throughput of how many transactions we can complete in a certain amount of time with a certain number of threads. So the first transaction, or the first benchmark I'll show you is a red-black tree. So it's an integer set um, implemented using a red-black tree. and um, the first thing I want you to notice is that I mean, we're, the differences here are entirely due to contention management policies. And you know, there's orders of magnitude 
just based on those 15 to 250 lines of code. Um, the best policies give linear speed up, um, pr pr up, pretty much up through the size of, almost the size of the machine. Um, and as you'll see in a second, um, one thing that's kind of interesting is the policies that do well here in general are not the same as the ones that do well in other benchmarks. Um, and in fact, uh, up until very recently, we hadn't found a single contention management policy that didn't do abysmally in at least one benchmark. Um, our Polka manager, which is the purple asterisks, is the only one we've ever found that doesn't bomb on at least one benchmark. Yes? Uh, exactly. So we, we've got a, so I mean the transactions consist of adding or removing an element from a red-black tree. And we keep the size of the set constrained so that elements are only between 0 and 255. So we're artificially keeping a very high level of contention. Um, I mean the maximum depth of the tree is log base 2 of 256, which is 8. Um, and So the, the, the union of granularity is a single tree node. Um, and yeah, and so in a a tr an operation in a red-black tree, insert or delete, insert, consists first of starting at a central starting point, the root of the tree, working your way down to an insertion or deletion point, and then working your way back up, um, rebalancing the tree as you go. And so a transaction working its way down can meet one that's coming back up. And so if there's any propensity to deadlock in a contention manager, um, you'll run into it. Um, the kindergarten manager um, does comparatively poorly here because um, a transaction that's working its way back up, if it clobbers one that's coming down, well, then that one restarts, and hey, we meet into each other again closer to the root, and now it's your turn to win. So that particular idea turns out to be very bad for a benchmark like this. Um, second one I'll show you um, is a simulation of a web, of a web cache um, proxy. So using the LFU algorithm, which basically um, LFU stands for least frequently used. So the idea is that frequency of access rather than recency of access is the key factor in determining whether a particular page is likely to be hit again. We use a ZIPF distribution, so exponential with a long tail, for selecting which pages are going to be hit. Um, and the tr benchmark itself consists of a priority queue heap where the things towards the leaves are the most frequently hit. And um, our Polka manager gets almost flat throughput um, on this, and the other ones all drop off quite a bit. Um, most pages, most hits are all to the same small set of pages, and so pretty much transactions are all in conflict. So flat linear throughput is about as good as you can hope for here. Um, but as you can see, different approaches don't do um, give very different performance in terms of how well they are able to achieve that. So, um, the I believe that the reason So it does reasonably well up through the first couple of threads and then drops off. And it could be just a question of the tuning parameters. Um, individual transactions here are so fast that um, I, I guess that's as good an answer as I can give you. Because the transactions are so fast, the, the um, any sort of um, 
delay in getting them affected can really slow down the overall system throughput. The Polka manager does really well precisely because by spreading transactions out in time, it actually arranges for them never to run into each other. And um, I guess the tuning parameters of the exponential backoff were probably not chosen particularly well for this benchmark. Yes? Um, no, it's a randomized exponential backoff, but th if um, the, so there's a cap on how, how much you can grow the exponent. So for example, in the Ethernet protocol, you don't grow beyond 2 to the 10th um, microseconds before resending a packet. We have a, we have a, similarly, we have a cap in, so if we, if we, if someone's in the way, then we wait for a certain length of time, and if they're still there, then we double that length. There's a cap on how far we'll go before we just um, clobber the other guy. And it's possible that that cap is too low for this benchmark. Um, exponential backoff, um, you, know, you, you see the same thing in a test and test and set lock. Um, it works well for limited numbers of threads, but beyond a certain point, it doesn't scale. So, I'd um, like to move on to non-blocking synchronization. So, as I mentioned, non-blocking synchronization is that in which the failure or delay of any single thread can't hurt the overall throughput of the system as a whole. And generally, although not always, unblocking algorithms use an optimistic update pattern in which sort of a three-step process. So the first step is you do some work to set up your operation, then with a single atomic operation, affect everything all at once. And then if there's any sort of cleanup needed afterwards, um, then you can do that, but because your operation is logically affected, enough data is visible that any other thread can also do that cleanup for you. Um, the atomic effect all at one step is typically done with um, atomic read, modify, write operations such as compare and swap, um, which takes three parameters, a pointer, an expected, and new value. And if the contents of the pointer match the expected value, swap in the new value and return true, otherwise return false. So. I mentioned that um, for non-blocking algorithms, linearizability, uh, which is due to Herlihy and Wing, is the gold standard for correctness. The idea is that you identify a linearization point as the moment where the, an operation appears to take place, and in particular that you, so each operation in a concurrent object has a linearization point somewhere between the invocation and the response of the object. So, for example, um, if one th NQ operation finishes before another one starts, then the semantics of a Q say that the first DQ should get the first value that was NQ. And the way we, by having guaranteeing that, that the linearization point for the first NQ is before the linearization point of the second one, that's the hook that we use to build that semantics. By comparison, um, oh. So, if the two dequeuing threads overlap, then whichever one has its um, linearization point first is the one that gets the data. So, in particular, um, even though thread three here started well before thread four, um, if thread four happens to have its linearization point first, then thread four can get the first datum and thread three the second, even though that's intuitively not necessarily how you would expect a queue to work. Um, linearizability theory traditionally has been applied only to operate methods and objects that are total. Um, so, for example, consider an attempt to dequeue an object from an otherwise empty queue. And 
in a totalized approach, we would simply say, no, the queue's empty, nothing here for you, bye. Um, but a partial approach would be to wait until data becomes available and then supply the data. So a very common idiom with, used with the totalized approach is to simply try in a loop. Is there anything there for me? No. Is there anything there for me? No. And keep pulling until data becomes available, and then you're, you're set. Um, but this has some drawbacks. It introduces some really heavy contention on data structures. And the output uh, is a function of which thread happens to retry its um, pull first. So for example, e here, even though thread 1 has started dequeuing well before thread 2, um, after some NQ comes along, if thread 2 happens to retry first, then it'll get the datum and um, the first data that's available. And thread 1 that's been waiting forever might not get data until substantially later. So intuitively, what we want is that um, you know, when you first go in, you s kind of set yourself up so that you're, you're registering yourself as wanting the data so that there's a, you get the next data that comes along. And our dual linearizability does exactly that. We break partial methods into two first class um, total operations. So there's a pre-blocking reservation step and a post-blocking follow-up step. So here, the, if the reservation phase of this DQ operation completes before the second DQ starts, then T1 is registered as wanting the next data that comes along. And so when a piece of data happens, um, it, the semantics of a queue, we now have a hook to say which thread should get that data. And so the data goes to the threads as expected. Um, so the dual in dual linearizability, to answer your question from earlier, Tom, is that these are data structures that can hold either data or these reservations. And the term actually comes from a um, hardware-supported su feature of the BBN butterfly processor from the 80s. Um, there doesn't have to be. On a uniprocessor, there will be. On a multiprocessor, you can... So... So, the way any sort of block... Once you've established your reservation, then you have... You can just check your reservation to see if data is available. And you can do that either with a busy spin or um, by marking your thread ID down and going to sleep, only to be resumed when data becomes available, av available for you. Oh, so th there are multiple approaches that can be taken to this blocking in between the two halves. If the thread goes away, th um, then what will happen um, is that when someone else will come along, satisfy that reservation at some point, the data that is used to satisfy that reservation uh, will es essentially be lost, but the rest of the system will continue unharmed. So if, if someone eventually if someone eventually comes along to satisfy the reservation um, to provide data, then um, so you give it to, when so in the case of a queue, you give it to the oldest outstanding reservation. Yes, because that, you have you have no way of telling whether that thread is there in the common case. Right. On the other hand, you know, so, so what's happened there is we've 
So you're, you're talking about a case where we've had a thread failure, and rather than the whole system melting down, we lose one piece of data, but the system is otherwise able to continue exactly as before. Um, you can add timeout support, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the case you're describing is one in which the thread is killed um, without being able to can cancel the reservation. Well, maybe we can talk offline about that more. So the reason this is important is that this opens up an, ent the, an entire class of data structures, those with partial methods, to being able to be supported in non-blocking synchronization techniques. Before this, it was not possible to do a non-blocking implementation of anything with a partial method. It, it just was me not a meaningful thing to say. And as we'll see in a little bit, you get some really big performance benefits from being able to do this. So I'll talk about two different data structures, although given the time, probably I'll have to skip the second. So synchronous queues are a communication channel. It's a synchronized communication channel, producer-consumer structure in which a producer waits for an explicit acknowledgement from the consumer that data has been received and used. And these things are very important in the theory and practice of concurrency. Um, they are involved in the implementation of language level synchronization primitives. Um, they form a key portion of um, CSP handoff and they're closely related to the rendezvous channels of ADA. Uh, they're widely used in message passing software and in particular, in how I got into them is that they are a backbone of the Java thread pool executor uh, class that is the framework of many, if not most, uh, thread pool implementations. So from a genealogical perspective, um, synchronous queues come in two flavors. There's a fair mode queue in which we guarantee a strict FIFO ordering of the, the first job that comes in is the first job that's processed. And there's an unfair mode in which we don't make any such guarantee. Um, in practice, we actually use a, a strict LIFO ordering in the unfair mode. So whichever comes in first is the last one to be executed. Um, but in each case, um, w what we've done is the, so there's some existing non-blocking algorithm. In the case of queues, it's the Michael and Scott queue. In the case of stacks, it's one due to triber. And added blocking at the consumer level. So if I'm waiting for data, then if it's, I wait until it becomes available and um, if data isn't currently available. So adding that consumer level blocking is the dual queue and dual stack that I mentioned earlier. And then adding blocking to the producer side is making the full synchronous queue. And we also add timeout support and cleanup of the data structure if um, data becomes, or if dead nodes inside the data structure accumulate too much, in or, just in order to keep from space leaks being an issue. So in interest of time, I will focus on the fair mode queues. So let me start by just giving a quick overview of how the Michael and Scott queue works. Um, so the queue itself at all times consists of a head pointer and a tail pointer. Um, and there is always at least one node inside the queue, a dummy node. That um, So in the empty queue, the head and tail pointer point to the same node. Now, the queue is linked from head to tail. And the tailmost node um, in a um, quiescent state has a null next pointer. 
So the NQ process in this queue consists of first reading the head and tail pointers, making sure that they, um, actually you don't even need to do that. So you read the tail pointer and read its next pointer. And if the next pointer is non-null, then you know that there's a NQ in process that you need to help finish. I'll come back to that in a second. Let's assume for now that the next pointer is null. Then your, the first thing you do is use a compare and swap to insert your new node into the tail of, or into the next pointer of the old tail node. Then as a cleanup step, you or anyone else can swing the tail pointer, advance the tail pointer to um, point from the old tail node to what becomes the new tail node. And so the linearizability, the linearization point for an NQ operation is when we successfully compare and swap a new node into the next pointer of the old tail. The DQ operation consists of reading the head and tail pointers, making sure that they do not point to the same node. If they do, then the queue is empty. Otherwise, um, or if they do, then the queue is empty unless it's the case that the next pointer of the tail node is null, is non-null, in which case you have to advance the tail pointer and start over. Otherwise, so as I mentioned, at all times, the, dummy, the headmost node in the queue is the dummy node. So we read the next node in the queue, and then use a compare and swap operation to advance the head pointer to that node, which simultaneously marks it as the current dummy node and claims the data the old dummy node can then be reclaimed. To create the dual queue, so again, the dual queue is where we have separate um, reservation and data nodes. Um, we um, implement this by using flag bits inside the nodes to distinguish their type. Um, and we have the invariant that the queue at all times is either all data or all a series of requests. And so long as the queue consists only of data nodes, it's actually exactly the same behavior as what I just showed you. On the other hand, reservations, requests, are anti-symmetric to data. So if I'm doing a DQ operation and the queue is empty or contains only data, then I actually NQ a reservation node. Um, similarly, an NQ operation, if the, de if the queue contains reservations, will DQ and satisfy one. And so getting this correct requires some very tricky consistency checks that I uh, won't have time to go into. But one interesting thing to point out is that the dummy node now, um, which is just the last thing in the queue, can be flagged as either a reservation or data. And so there's an extra state of empty queue to watch out for, which leads to a lot more corner cases in the implementation. So. Again, so in the case where we're NQing um, and the queue consists of reservations, so first notice that reservation nodes have an extra data pointer that, that is associated with them. So the NQ process consists of the same checks as before and then reading, and then reading the next pointer of the dummy node to find the oldest extant reservation. We then use a compare and swap to provide an, a data item to that reservation. Um, and once that's done, that's the linearization point at which the reservation is satisfied and the NQ operation is effected. And then we or anyone else can update the head pointer um, to cut out the old dummy node. Now, on the part of the process or the thread that is waiting for this item, it can simply spin on this pointer, and as soon as it becomes non-null, it knows that data is available. So it doesn't have to introduce any contention on the pointers and the main data structure itself. Yes? The dummy node is read by 
whoever clips it out, whoever successfully cases it out of the queue. So you use a compare and swap to update the head pointer from the old dummy node to the new one. And if you use a compare and swap, then only one thread's attempt to do that can succeed. Um, this is true, and, and actually, as a special case, in um, you, you can't use a general purpose memory allocator for this. Um, once a block of memory has been allocated for use in the queue, and this is true of the original Michael and Scott queue as well, it's forevermore allocated for use as a queue node, unless you go to some advanced pointer tracking system to make sure that there are no outstanding references. Um, so our synchronous queue, as I mentioned, extends the dual queue. So we've already had um, the ability for consumers to block on producers. And so we're basically just adding blocking for the other direction, if you will. So in particular, um, with a data node, now we add a pointer to be you compare and swap from nil to yeah, I've got it. And just a sentinel value that says the, the value has been claimed. And again, once that is non-nil, um, and, and that node reaches the head of the queue, anybody can um, reclaim that node. Um, and then finally, we add timeout support. So, if you imagine this if, this, if this node wants to time out, then all it has to do is use a compare and swap to t take this pointer and change it from nil to anything non-nil. And then once this reaches the head of the queue, anyone can see that it's a satisfied reservation because it's non-nil. It'll look like a satisfied reservation, even though it's not really and cut it out of the queue and move on to the next dummy, the next one. So um, using the same Sunfire 6800, um, we did some microbenching performance comparisons of the, the, these synchronous queues, this one and the one based on the dual stack that I didn't have time to tell you about. Um, and compared them to previously best known performing implementations. So probably the best known algorithm for doing a synchronous queue is due to Hansen. And it gives comparatively, I mean it gives flat pr throughput that is relatively poor. And the Java 5 implementations um, outperformed Hansen's queue up to, through a small number of threads, um, in fair mode, um, and otherwise are, were about the same. But the, if you went to the unfair mode, where you didn't insist on FIFO ordering of, um, of data, then you got a substantial performance gain. So there's a, in the Java 5, there's a big performance penalty associated with fair mode versus unfair mode synchronous queuing. By comparison, our synchronous queues, um, as you can see, not only do they outperform the Java 5 ones by a large factor, but there's also no performance penalty for um, fair mode versus unfair mode. Uh, let's see, these tests were conducted with three producers and um, no, I'm sorry. So the numbers on the x-axis are the number of producer-consumer pairs. So at six, then we've got six producers and six consumers. Um, the y-axis is the number of operations per second throughput that was obtained. This is 
Not entirely sure, to be honest with you. Um, one possibility is some sort of increased um, cash miss intention that is. So with a single th pair, you, you don't really have cash misses. With, um, you know, except between producers and consumers. You don't have com competition between producers or between consumers. At two pairs, you've got more of that. And my best guess is that at two threads, the, um, you get in, the increased competition is enough to cause a lot of ping-ponging back and forth between the cash lines without really getting any sort of um, pipelining going on to balance that out. You see a similar thing with Q-based locks, for example. The MCS Q-based lock has a um, performance hit at two processors that it then recovers thereafter. Um, in a timeout storm test, um, we arranged for consumers to wait, or for producers and consumers to wait just a hair short of long enough for the exchange to actually happen. And so what this really does is heavily exercise the throughput or the um, timeout sequencing or the timeout code. And as you can see, um, the Java 5 fair mode queue gives really poor throughput because it's particularly bad at timeout support. Unfair mode is a little bit better, but both of our queues are subs give substantially better performance. Let's see. Um, so I've been going for an hour. Should I wrap up or? Okay. Then. Um, okay. Sure. Okay, so an exchanger is just a transfer channel in which threads do pairwise exchange of data. Um, these are um, useful, for example, in parallel implementations of genetic algorithms where we're, you're swapping chromosomes between participants um, and also useful for a particularly elegant producer-consumer buffer exchange implementation in which a um, consumer trades an emptied buffer to a producer for a full one. And this simplifies memory management because you never need more than the two buffers. And also has the side effect of automatically throttling the producer to not create data any faster than the consumer can eat it. And our exchange, I'll ex explain our exchanger in two steps. So the Exchange channel, um, when an exchange channel when empty consists of just a null pointer, and to if you're the first comer to the channel, then you swap in a data stru structure that has your object and a hole for someone else to match to you, and the second one that comes along will either will co attempt to compare and swap that hole pointer from nil to a matching object. Once that happens, the exchange is complete, and anybody can use a compare and swap to get back to the first state. However, at the same time, if I've run out of patience, then I can compare and swap my whole pointer from nil to a failed sentinel. And then I'll, again, if I succeed on that, then it will look like a completed exchange, and anyone else will help throw it out so that we can get back to the base state and keep going on the channel. However, um, to improve the throughput, we add something called the arena. And this is using a technique called elimination introduced by Shavit and Tuatu in 95. So the idea is rather than having a single exchange channel, we've got an array of them. And each t on each round of the process, um, try to exchange in the main channel. And if that fails, go to one of the back off channels for a little bit wait, and if someone happens to meet up with you, great, you're done, you both go home happy, and you don't need to touch the main channel at all. Otherwise, 
you go, um, you work your way back up to, or otherwise you try the main channel again and then expand the range of how far out you're willing to go, picking a random one within that range and growing the range of how far out you go each time and how long you wait within the channel each time. So it's basically exponential back off, um, but it has the advantage that um, someone that's backing off can be matched and never have to join in the first place or never have to go back to the main channel. And just to give you a sense for this really quickly, um, the Java 5 exchanger implementation has flat throughput and we get linear th performance gain of, and actually get about a factor of 50 gain relative to the Java 5 implementation by 12 threads. And this difference in performance means the difference between degrada performance degradation as you increase the number of threads and linear speed up in a genetic algorithm application that uses the an exchanger. So, um, so just to conclude, my research has focused to date on fixing locks by creating scalable, preemption tolerant user mode locks that um, are fully preemption tolerant yet require no special kernel mode support. Um, my work has studied the or has pioneered the study of contention management. There are now at least three other groups studying the problem. Um, and we've expanded non-blocking synchronization to um, objects with partial methods and um, created dual linearizability and thus the dual stack and dual queues which have formed the basis of the exchanger and synchronous queue algorithms that are very practical um, and have been adopted for the Java 6 concurrency library, in recognition of which I've been named one of seven full members of the um, Java Community Process Expert Group on Concurrency, uh, formerly JSR 166. Um, future work, there's a lot more work to be done in dual data structures. Um, a dual data structure based implementation of a semaphore um, offers the same kind of performance gain as we've seen in the other ones. Imagine if you had a semaphore that um, you could use it and it wasn't slow. And you know, so slow that it's not usable in production software. Imagine if you had a really fast semaphore implementation. How would that change the way you program applications? Um, priority queues and skip lists similarly are candidates for implementation using our dual data structure methodology. Um, to the extent that I stay involved with um, Java community process, I'd like to work on continuing to remove locks from the concurrency library and at least in places where that doing so improves the performance. Um, I think it's time to start reevaluating the types of hardware primitives that are available. 20 years ago, the Motorola 68020 had a DCAS primitive, same as the compare swap that I showed you earlier, but it takes has two pointers, two expected values, two new values, and only succeeds if both pointer, the contents of both pointers match both expected values, in which case it does two um, completely disjoint updates. And so there have been enough changes in the trade-offs of hardware and bus and so on that you know, it's possible to re-examine these, which primitives are available. Um, we're seeing much more um, multi-chip and SMT and CMP hardware systems. And so one of the features of these is that the latency of communication between two thread contexts, um, if they're on the same, inside the same core, inside the same chip, is going to be really, really short. But if they're across the bus from each other, then it might be long. So there's a very big difference in scale, similar to what we've already been dealing with in distributed computing for some time now, and so there's opportunities to bring those types of approaches into mainstream algorithms at a finer scale and gain based on that. Uh, longer term, there's a convergence between high performance computing and desktop computing. Um, just the parallelism that was once the domain of high performance computing 
is coming to the desktop. And so there are t these two communities that haven't really been talking to each other at all, and well, there's a lot to be gained by getting them to talk to each other. Um, similarly, software systems have huge investments in locks, um, millions of lines of codes, literally centuries of development time. Um, and so, I mean, just the amount of complexity that introduces, I mean, it's no wonder that we're looking at multi-year release cycles for things like Oracle. Um, and so overcoming that inertia, either by semi-automatic conversion of applications to a transactional model, or looking for high payoff opportunities for high profile optimizations, um, just to help convince people to switch over to transactions are very useful things to consider. Um, and then finally, currently, if a piece of, if a particular data structure is controlled using one type of synchronization, um, lock-based synchronization or non-locking synchronization, then you can't also um, access it with a different type of synchronization. The, the different types are completely inter non-interoperable. Yeah, that's a tough word to say. Um, and so looking into ways to get them to work together nicely is a challenge for the future, especially in the short term as transactions come to the forefront and um, locks are still heavily present in legacy code. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions. Oh, Megan McCoy. So the, the guy from Cray, um, I forget his name. I, m I met him at PIPA about a month ago. And they're dealing with a very specialized problem in which memory is, you know, they're, they're looking at a very, very much at the fine grain, or I'm sorry, the high performance computing scientific application domain. And memory is allocated for gigantic matrices or arrays all in big blocks and you allocate lots of it all at once and um, release it all at the same time as well. And so they've got an implementation that's very tuned to that kind of environment. And one drawback of it, of their implementation, is that it handles something or if I'm only keeping part of the memory that I allocate around, then um, their implementation is very, very susceptible to internal fragmentation. And um, they pretty much have to do a stop the world and reshuffle all memory approach to um, resolve that issue. The work that Magid presented um, does not suffer from that limitation. So it's a more general purpose memory allocator versus a special purpose memory allocator. I mean, it's a pretty common theme. The special purpose approach can solve in cases where the, can give you better performance in cases where the general purpose um, thing can't do as well. Uh, to a certain extent, I mean, the non-blocking algorithms in general, you can think of them as special purpose implementations of non-blocking algorithms. And you can think of um, transactional memory as a more general purpose. So if I use a non-blocking transactional memory system and I implement a queue using that, then if I take the output of all of that and condense it down and apply a bunch of compiler optimizations or whatever and end up with you know, a really nice tight implementation of a non-blocking queue, well, then the hand-coded one is what you're Potentially, is essentially the endpoint of where you're going to get. 
Um, so one of the real questions with transactional memory versus non-blocking synchronization is how much can we get rid of the overheads of transactional memory and use compiler optimizations and so on to get to the same point with that we're reaching in the hand-coded non-blocking implementation. Yes? Yes? So the difference would be in terms of, I mean, we're talking about constant differences, really, but the potential difference is in how many context switches would have to be involved in um, going from, so, so if I'm waiting on a semaphore, then you know, if the semaphore is already available, then I have the potential of um, going immediately in the dual methodology. Um, so it, it's, it's opening up the possibility of a local spin semaphore. So that if the semaphore becomes available within a certain amount of time after I um, come in and ask for it, then I don't have to have gone to a to the context switch overhead out and then back in for blocking. Yeah. There have been several non-blocking implementations of doubly ended queues, um, or deeks, as they're sometimes called, but they don't, the implementations that exist do not give good performance. Um, right. So what are the operations you need? In left and right insert and delete? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 